now that Oliver has given me permission, I'll tell you that um, my grandson calls me Pop Pop, and I call him the Buddha. <laughs> He's a fat little kid, and <laughs> we sit him out on the floor naked, and we just all stand around and kind of look at him, stare at him. <laughs> and I, I feel I'm um, kind of on the edge of becoming a Buddhist, and I think I know what that feels like. Jonah. Jonah, on his way to Tarshish, pursuing his career in religion, found himself in stormy weather. In the middle of the big storm, he had the good sense to get off the ship, inviting the sailors to dump him. His trip to Tarshish was ruined, and his vocation was saved. My thesis is that the pastor doesn't belong on the religious ship, this Tarshish destined ship. And the sooner he or she is thrown overboard, the better off everyone's going to be. <laughs> most religion, most religion is not gospel. Most religion is idolatry. Most religion is self-aggrandizement. It is urgently required that pastors distinguish between culture religion and Christian gospel. In the middle of that great storm, Jonah learned to distinguish. For me, the sea storm was internal, not external. I had been pastor to my newly organized congregation for about three years when I realized that things weren't going at all well. I was getting seasick. I had accepted a call to pastoral ministry and something wasn't right and I didn't know what it was. In the beginning of this work, I had no sense at first that anything was wrong. Everything was going right. I had cause to be satisfied with my vocational self, content with my ministry. I had, in, to quote the Jonah passage, gone down into the inner part of the ship and lain down and was fast asleep. <laughs> Externally, things couldn't have gone better. The ship was going where it was supposed to go. I'd been called to organize a church and I'd organized it. We were now self-supporting. The financial goals that had been set by my supervisors had been met. We'd raised the funds necessary for our first building venture. A sanctuary had been constructed. I was riding a crest of affirmation from my congregation. My work was praised by those who had put me to it. I was on my way to Tarshish and oblivious that there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. The captain came to me and said, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call upon your God. Perhaps the God will give thought to us that we do not perish. Not the captain exactly. Actually, the person who said that to me was my five-year-old daughter. I was sitting in the living room after supper. She came to me asking me to read her a book. I told her I couldn't because I had a meeting at the church. And she said, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call upon your God. <laughs> Those weren't her exact words. <laughs> her exact words were, this is the 38th night in a row you haven't been home. She'd been counting. And I woke up. I realized that I was not doing what I had been called to do. I recognized a kind of nagging internal restlessness that I had been very successfully repressing. I was not, in fact, feeling at all well inside. And now that my within, with Karen's little sermon, had wakened up, I found I was crying out, or there was a crying out within me, 
protesting against the way I was living, compulsively working these long hours in order to succeed at the business of being a church. The American North American religious ship, well outfitted as it is, full of passengers as it is, is the wrong place for the pastor to be. Religious activity in our continent is across the board pretty popular. There is absolute religious freedom, which means that we can be religious any old way we want to, but the way we want to doesn't have a lot to do with the biblical originals. North American religion is basically a consumer religion. We see God as a product that will help us live well or live better, and having seen that, we do what consumers do. We shop for the best deal. Pastors, hardly realizing what we're doing, start making deals, packaging the God product so that people will be attracted to it, and then present it in such ways that will beat the opposition. Religion has never been so taken up with public relations, image building, salesmanship, marketing techniques, and the competitive spirit. Pastors who grow up in this atmosphere have no awareness that there's anything out of the way in such practice. It's this good old free enterprise system that works so well for everyone, except for the poor and a few minorities. <coughs> Freedom of religion is one of the four freedoms that we esteem, but it has not flowered into any maturity in religion. Our constitutionally protected freedom of religion has in fact turned out to be a culture enslaved religion. Chesterton lamented this cultural conformism of the religious establishment in the opening decades of our century in England the closing decades in, on this continent match them like a bookend. Far from being radical and dynamic, most of religion is lethargic canonization of worldly wisdom. That's, these are Chesterton's words. A lethargic canonization of worldly wisdom leading us not to freedom, but to the degrading slavery of being a child of the age. I think something similar took place in education. <clears throat> Educational practices produced a population in which virtually everyone had access to learning, high degree of literacy. And the reading skills that used to be a privilege of a few people now are accessible to everybody, virtually everybody. And what's the result? I don't know what your equate, a Canadian equivalent is, but in the States, the TV Guide is the largest circulation magazine in the country. That's what we use this expensive education to read. Our nation of readers uses its wonderful capacity for reading to read billboards, commercials, watered down pep talks, humorous anecdotes. I don't think I'd ever voluntarily live in a place where education was only accessible to the wealthy and the privileged. But simply by providing the ability to read has probably lowered rather than raised the intellectual level of the nation. And I don't think I would voluntarily live in a place where the freedom to choose and practice religion was illegal and had to be pursued underground. But when we look around at the results of this most extensive experiment in the free expression of religion. It's hard to be very pleased or impressed. Surveyed as a whole, we're immersed in probably the most immature, mindless religion, ranging from infantile to adolescent, that any culture has ever witnessed. It's always interesting to me to listen to comments that outsiders, people particularly from third world countries, make on the religion that they observe in North America. What they notice mostly is the greed, the silliness, the narcissism. They appreciate the size and prosperity of our churches, our energy, the technology, 
but they wonder at the conspicuous absence of the cross, the phobic avoidance of suffering, the puzzling indifference to community and relationships of intimacy. And what I'm objecting to is this appalling and systematic trivializing of the pastoral office. It's part of a larger trivialization, that of the culture itself. A trivialization so vast and epidemic that there are many days when its ruin seems assured. There are other days when we catch a glimpse of glory, a man here, a woman there, determined to live nobly, singing a song, telling a story, working honestly, loving chastely. Pockets of resistance are formed when these men and women recognize each other and take heart from each other. The Jonah story is a standing rebuke to us, and it shows us that we do not have to acquiesce in the trivialization of our work, our call to be pastors in the Church of Christ. As it is, I think there's just too much caving in, caving into the culture. A staggeringly high percentage of pastors actually collaborate with the enemy. This world that wants a religion that's mostly entertainment with occasional breaks for moral commercials. But not everybody. Every few days or so, another pastor gets out of bed and says, that's it, I quit. I refuse to be branch manager any longer in a religious warehouse outlet. I'll no longer spend my life marketing God to religious consumers. I just read the job description the culture handed me, and I'm not buying it any longer. Every few days, another Jonah saying, throw me off the ship. Take me up, throw me into the sea. Well, when I woke up, when I saw this, when I was looked at what I was doing, realized that I'd bought into something which was so silly, so <coughs> unbiblical, so trivializing, I decided I'd get off, get off this Tarshish destined ship, and then I found that I couldn't. The compulsive work habits had such a grip on me that I couldn't get rid of them. But I was so horrified at the consequences, not being a father to my daughter, not being a husband to my wife, not being pastor to my congregation. I was so horrified that I was determined to extricate myself from the shipwreck that seemed imminent, the shipwreck of my life that seemed imminent. And so in desperation, I went to my session, which is the ruling body that I work with, and resigned. I told the story to them of my wake-up call from my daughter. I told them I had no time for close personal relationships. I had no time for prayer. Not only was there no time, but my very capacity for love and prayer had atrophied alarmingly. I told them I'd been trying to change. I'd been trying at this point for two or three months. I could not. I could see no way out but to get out and start someplace else new or in some other work. And I said to them, take me up and throw me into the sea. And they did it, but not in the way I asked. Instead, what they, di they did was ask me a question. They said, what do you want to do? Well, I knew what I wanted to do. I said, I want to study God's word long and carefully so I can stand before you and preach and teach and be accurate as I do it. I want to pray slowly and lovingly so that my relation with God will be inward and honest. And I want to be with you often and leisurely so that we can recognize each other as close companions on the way of the cross and be available for counsel and encouragement to each other. One of the elders said to me, in astonishment, I remember his astonishment, he says, if that's what you want to do, why don't you do it? Nobody told you you couldn't, did they? <laughs> <laughs> and 
and I, with just a little touch of anger, not much, but enough, said, because I have to run this damn church. Do you realize that running this church is a full-time job? There's no time to be a pastor. I guess there was more than a little anger. <laughs> so another elder said to me, why don't you let us run the church? I said, you don't know how. <laughs> and he said, sounds to me like you don't know how to be a pastor either. <laughs> how about you let us learn how to run the church and we let you learn how to be a pastor? Well, it was one of those wonderful moments in the life of the church when the heavens open and the dove descends. And we talked about what we were going to do from that moment on, encouraging each other, helping each other. They'd learn how to run the church. I'd learn how to be a pastor. They determined that except for moderating that session and the Board of Deacons, the two boards that I have to deal with, I would not attend any more meetings. They explored the ways in which they would develop the ministries to which they were called and ordained. I've always thought of it as the night that the sailors threw me off the ship. Two weeks later, it was a Tuesday evening, I was home, I had nothing to do. <laughs> Tried television, nothing, I picked up a book, nothing. The children were in bed. My wife was in a long conversation on the telephone. The finance committee, the most important committee of the church, <laughs> was meeting in my study at the church. I live a half mile from the church, a seven minute walk. I walked the half mile in six minutes. <laughs> Entered my study. The committee meeting was vigorously underway. I sat at the edge, outside the edge of the circle of chairs. And the elder in charge interrupted, and he said, Pastor, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I said, well, I didn't have anything to do this evening. I thought I'd just come and give you some moral encouragement. And he said, you don't trust us, do you? <laughs> that wasn't what I expected. I expected some gratitude. <laughs> And I wasn't used to being addressed that way. And all these defensive kind of things started to simmer, boil. But I never spoke them. The challenge was abrupt. It was accurate. And so I said, I guess I don't, but I'll try. And I left. And I haven't been back. It was 25 years ago, 26 years ago. And now began the long, long process of learning how to be a pastor. For me, for them, learning how to run a church. How do I embody this life of prayer and scripture and spiritual direction in this most uncongenial of settings? A church world that puts no value on them, or little. A congregation that's always expecting something more in the way of solace or performance or entertainment. If I'm not going to sail on the religious ship where everyone is crying out to his or her own God, how am I going to survive in these ocean depths of God and the church? I've been told that when people are drowning, and I never know how you find this out, <laughs> but when people are drowning, their whole life goes in front of their eyes. If they're drowning, how do we get that message back? But anyway, I've been told that. Something that, like that began to happen for me right now. As I abandoned my religious careerism and embraced this pastoral vocation, it wasn't instant replay exactly, but early experiences, early influences, gradually and insistently began to present themselves to me. Voices from the past, cables from the cemetery, calls from childhood. I found myself going back over the trail that had led me to this place, examining the turns, the intersections, sifting for clues. Why did I become a pastor in the first place? What was formative in my life? 
what's the authentic core out of which I work? I was trying to find out who I was, what this call, this vocation was, <coughs> and how I'd missed it, where I'd, where I'd gone astray. And the trail led first and obviously to my mother. She was the healthiest and liveliest shaping influence in both my spiritual and vocational formation. But I hadn't noticed that. I had no idea that she'd influenced me vocationally. It was not obvious, not at all clear, until that storm came up. Her influence was obscured by the discontinuity between the conditions that I grew up in and the conditions in which I was now trying to learn how to be a pastor. I'd grown up in a small western town in a Pentecostal church in the company of immigrant Scandinavians who were mostly contemptuous of the established churches. They left all that behind in Norway and Sweden, had no reverence for authority. The town in which I grew up was only 40 years old when I was born. None of the adults I knew had gone to college or university. I was now a 33-year-old Presbyterian pastor in a middle-class suburb near the old and genteel city of Baltimore, a city rich in colonial traditions in which the authority of both religion and learning was in high regard. The contrast between my small town Pentecostal Montana upbringing and my suburban Presbyterian Maryland workplace seemed pretty black and white. There were no obvious continuities until I asked this question about my mother, about my vocation, about what I was as a pastor. And then the connection started to be obvious. And the most obvious one was the life of my mother. My mother was young, 20 years old, when she bore me. She was strikingly attractive, at least in my memory, but photographs confirm it. Her hair was luxuriously long, auburn, never cut during my childhood. That wasn't for cosmetic reasons, that was religious. She was a little over five feet tall, had a passion for the life of faith, and was determined to share it. One of my early childhood memories is accompanying her on Sunday evenings to one-room schoolhouses and grange halls in our valley where she would hold services, hold religious services. Lumberjacks and miners would assemble in the building and she would sing and preach. There were six or seven locations to which we would go. Kyla, Marion, Creston, Columbia Falls, Hungry Horse, Ferndale. We make this circuit about every two months. We did it all year long, summer and winter. She had a pure, clear, plain, folk singing kind of voice, and she accompanied herself on accordion or guitar. She led these small congregations sitting on bare benches, backless benches, in country gospel songs and ballads. And these lumberjacks, or miners, depending on where we were, came in there in their big boots, their bib overalls, their flannel shirts, and they loved it. She'd sing these sentimental old songs, and they'd weep, and they'd pull out their bandanas and honk into them. <laughs> 25, 30 of these men, there were never any women <laughs> meeting on Sunday nights. And then she'd preach. She was a wonderful storyteller. And she told stories out of scripture and out of life. Every once in a while she'd slip into a kind of incantatory style that I've heard since only in black churches. She'd get a phrase and she'd work this phrase like a surfer on a wave and just ride it and ride it and ride it until it was indelible, just the rhythms got into you. Wonderful, wonderful Montana nights. I like the winter nights the best, wind, cold. The rooms we'd be in were heated by barrel stoves, those old barrel stoves, and I'd get put in charge of feeding the fire through the night. Felt important. 
<clears throat> we'd leave these places, get stuck in snowdrifts. <clears throat> these men would come out and they'd heave us out of the snowdrifts and then start cursing as they did it and then apologize. <clears throat> <laughs> And my mother, what was she doing? She, was she innocent or was she fearless? Was she naive or was she bold? I don't know what she was, but she was full of... Here she had this little kid for an escort in those rough, backwoods, remote congregations, communities. I think it was love. I think it was the love that casts out fear, but I... Maybe I'm just hoping it was that. I loved it myself. It was high adventure. I loved being with my passionate mother who was having such a good time singing and telling stories. This went on all the years of my growing up. When I was about eight or nine years old, it stopped. I never knew why it stopped. It never occurred to me to ask at the time. There's so much that's unaccountable in the adult world that one more mystery doesn't make that much difference. <laughs> but later on as an adult, I did ask her. I asked my mother, why did you quit? Why did you quit those meetings, those Sunday night meetings? And she said that somebody came to her one day with an open Bible and read out, let a woman learn in silence with all submissiveness. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over men. She is to keep silent. So, wanting to be obedient to the Word of God, she became silent. But not before she had accomplished something formative in me. She had shaped, it turns out now as I look back, my vocational life. As I look back, this was 30 years later now, 25 years later, I was looking for the source of my vocation, how it, what was formed in me, what I thought it meant to be a pastor. And I came across this old artesian spring of song and story. I had been given access to the faith through the forms of song and story. Virtually everything I had been given in those impressionable years of my childhood had come in these containers of song and story. Everything about God, but also everything about being human, growing up, growing up to Christ, into adulthood. There's been a lot of attention in recent years to the power of liturgy in forming identity and the shaping effect of narrative in our understanding of scripture and gospel. The way we learn something is just as influential, maybe more, than what we learn. Content is never free-floating. It's always embedded in some form or other, some container. And for this basic and integrative experience of God and faith, the forms, if they're going to be appropriate, also have to be basic and integrative. And the basic and integrative forms are song and story. This isn't Christian doctrine. This is just human nature. This is what the people have been telling us as they've studied tribes in New Guinea. They could have come to the Flathead Valley and learned the same thing. Saved them a lot of money. <laughs> come with my mother and me through those schoolhouses and grange halls and saw how song and story worked in these simple, rough settings. What I assimilated into my bones those years was that God and passion were the essential ingredients for living. God was the reality with which we had to do. A passionate response was the only kind of response possible. I realized as I was working this out, trying to figure out who I was, that I had grown up under the tutelage of a woman for whom God mattered immensely. She was careless regarding conventions, reckless regarding security. There was nothing visible at the center of her life. It was this invisible God who energized her. And I had the good fortune to be introduced into life in the daily company of this woman of great passion who embraced life so exuberantly and intensely. Now I had it. God and passion. That's why I was a pastor. 
That's why I've come to this place, to live in the presence of God, to live with passion, and to gather others into the presence of God, introducing them into the possibilities of a passionate life. But I was on a religious ship for whom God was peripheral to the bottom line. God background to an enterprise that was mostly informed by psychology, sociology, and management by objective. The crew members who were my companions, while religious enough in a way, each one cried to his own God, systematically insulated themselves from passion. They lived safely and cautiously, getting their identity by means of what they, what they purchased, not by whom they loved. <coughs> There were occasional ventures into semi-passion in the form of adulterous affairs or weekend parties, but the passions were short-lived and not permitted to interfere with the overall appearance of respectability and the securities of consumer credit. Well, now at least I knew what I was up to. My task was clear to recover and nurture these essentials of my life and my vocation, God and passion, but in an environment that was not congenial to them. I want to guard against misunderstanding at this point. My journey, my analogy with the journey of Jonah is inexact right here. I still belong to the same denomination. I'm still pastor to the same congregation. I'm not angry at them anymore, although I was early on. I've come to understand and accept them for what they are more, not only accept, appreciate, delight in what they are. Because I was the one who caused the storm, not them. I was the one endangering their lives, not they mine. They just happened to be the environment, the sailors and the ships sailing for Tarshish, in which I was doing my fleeing. And for a while, because it was a very religious ship, each one crying to his or her own God, I thought I could get by with turning my vocation into a career. The storm, this intense inward unhappiness that I experienced as I got further and further from the source experiences of my life, brought me to my senses. Right during this time, I drove into Baltimore one day, my wife and I, we were going to hear a lecture, 45 minute drive onto the campus of Johns Hopkins University. We were to hear a lecture by Chaim Potok, the Jewish novelist. Potok is an intensely religious man, a Jew, explores, develops dimensions of the life of faith in our lives writes wonderful novels. I admired his writing. I wanted to hear him. He told us that afternoon that and this was just the very time in which I was getting myself thrown off the Tarshish ship. He said that he'd wanted to be a writer from an early age, but that when he went to college, his mother took him aside and said, Chaim, I know you want to be a, be a writer, but I have a better idea. Why don't you be a brain surgeon? keep a lot of people from dying, you make a lot of money. Chaim replied, no, Mama, I want to be a writer. He returned home for vacation, and his mother got him off alone. She said, Chaim, I know you want to be a writer, but I've got a better idea. Why don't you be a brain surgeon? Keep a lot of people from dying and make a lot of money. Mama, no, I want to be a writer. Well, that conversation was repeated every vacation, every summer year after year after year. Finally, he was getting ready to graduate from college, and she said, Chaim, I know you want to be a writer. You can go to graduate school now. You've got this out of your system. I want you to be a brain surgeon. I'll keep a lot of people from dying. You make a lot of money. And this time, Chaim exploded. He says, Mama, I don't want to keep people from dying. I want to show them how to live. And when he said that, he put words to what I was doing, trying to do, trying to figure out what to do. 
all these people around me, the culture around me saying, Eugene, I know you want to be a pastor. I have a better idea. Run a religious shop. You'll keep a lot of people from dying. You make a lot of money. <laughs> but I want to be a pastor. <laughs> Chaim Potok preached the gospel to me that day. He said, he focused what I was feeling when I was going through and I came driving back out of Baltimore. I was feeling this was getting clearer and clearer and clearer. And I was getting a deeper sense of what I was having to do and how to do it. I thought God and passion were the way to do it. I didn't quite know how to go about it. I needed help. I needed help recovering these energies I needed to start finding steps. I was groping my way. I had to work it out in this field in which I was living and working. The field was a cornfield, or what had recently been a cornfield. Asphalt strips, pavement wound through it, houses set alongside these asphalt strips in which people <laughs> sat and watched TV and had cornflakes for breakfast and ate frozen pizzas from their microwaves when they got seriously hungry. <laughs> they left these houses several hours every day to make what they called money. It's the only thing they ever make. If you can call what they do making it. Everything else they either buy or borrow, after which they abuse or waste it. Not everybody. There are some exceptions. But this is classic. North American consumer suburbia. And it was in the middle of that cornfield that doesn't look like a cornfield, but still has all the characteristics of a cornfield, repetitive, predictable, featureless, although as Van Gogh showed, capable of blazing beauty, if you look at it right, it was there in that setting, in that place, that I was determined to believe in God and live a life of passion. Somewhere along the way, as I was searching out my origins and realizing how they were coming to expression vocationally, I realized that alongside being a pastor, I was also a writer. My vocation was bipolar. I don't quite know how I knew this, for it was many years after this before I was published. But the conviction had deepened in me that writer is parallel to pastor in my vocation. They weren't in competition. They were somehow linked together. The pastor wasn't servant to the writer. The writer wasn't servant to the pastor. I wasn't just writing down things so people could read them. These were vocational twins, feeling, looking, acting much alike, but operating out of different bodies and each with its own integrity. Now that I knew what was central, I didn't find it easy to carry it out. But I did know that if God and passion became marginal to me, I would not be myself. I could not be myself. And so I went looking for people to help me, <coughs> trying to maintain my integrity in this writer-pastor vocation. I was looking for guides. I was looking for encouragement. And I found them. I began finding people who were doing these kinds of things. I began finding other people who were living this way. Not a lot of them, but there were enough to know that, for me to know that it could be done. And so I cultivated the relationships with these people, asking myself how they did it. I found many of them in books, libraries, few of them in people. Two or three in my congregation, and since then they've become more. And I'm still doing it, and I'm wanting you to do it, to turn away from what the culture gives us, dive into what God is giving us. After Jonah, the next great sea storm narrated in the scriptures is the story of Paul's shipwreck, Acts 27. 
Sea stories are enough of a rarity in our scriptures that when they occur, and occur here in Old Testament, New Testament parallel, they invite attention. Both of these stories are vocational. Lives, the lives of Jonah and Paul, are given definitive shape by God's call to this Word of God work as prophet in Jonah's case and apostle in St. Paul's. And when we set these two stories down alongside each other, the comparisons and contrasts come into view and begin to sharpen each other. Jonah is the type to which Paul is the anti-type. The disobedient prophet turned back from his flight from the face of God, the obedient apostle interrupted but not deterred in his pursuit of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. The stories are similar in length, almost the same size, and they're equally impressive in the skill of their narration. In both, ships are headed west across the Mediterranean Sea and are overtaken by a severe storm. In both, the chief characters along with the ship's crews are in peril, in peril of death by drowning. And in both, the protagonists are saved not only personally, but vocationally. Jonah turned back from his vocational disobedience and Paul confirmed in his vocational obedience. God's passion to work salvation in all the earth by means of his preached word is the pivot on which both stories turn. Salvation. God's will for every creature to experience the love that redeems is not a casual or a cool abstraction. This is a wild and extravagant energy. It's not reducible to human control. It's not harnessed to the service of a creation, of a vocation. The storm is all-encompassing, unmanageable, and as such, it provides the contextual analog for the unleashed spirit wind of God. Storm is the environment in which we either lose our lives or are saved. There is no cool, safe ledge on which to perch as spectators. There are no bleachers from which to enjoy the thunder and lightning, the waves and the breakers of the storm. We're in it. Prophet, pastor, people, sailors, saints, Nothing else matters at this point. It's life or death. Whatever else has been on the agenda is off. There's this single item, salvation or not. Once the storm hits, Jonah is out of control. He has been quite deftly in control before the storm. He decided on his Tarshish destination he paid the considerable sum required to get him to Tarshish, the cost of a long voyage as far as the Straits of Gibraltar and beyond, lasting almost a year, would have been no small matter. Jonah is presented to us as a man with money, able to finance his self-will, his self-determination. The word used for her price, Sakara is a third person feminine, has a third person feminine suffix on it, sikara. Its antecedent is the immediate or preceding word for ship, aniya, a feminine noun. So we have a feminine noun now, modify, a feminine noun being modified by a, uh, a noun with a feminine suffix. So it's the price of her ship. This is a subtle little thing, but this was a skillful writer. We get the impression, ironically conveyed here now, that Jonah was able to pay the price for the whole ship. He wasn't just buying a passage. The whole thing was being financed by Jonah. He was taking charge of this operation completely. He's in charge, and let there be no mistake about it. But his assertive mood, move to take charge of this vocational destiny and his considerable financial wherewithal to bring it, bring it about are now 
in the storm insignificant. God's storm and God's salvation or not salvation now dominate the scene. Jonah's will and Jonah's money are now trifling. Paul is also out of control on his ship. The winter voyage was launched contrary to his counsel. He had advised wintering at the Cretan harbor of Fair Havens, but the captain and the ship owner overrode his advice, making the decision to sail for Rome, presumably for economic reasons. Money, here it is again, a powerful element in human autonomy, holds a key place now again. Jonah, using his access to a large sum of money to purchase, purchase passage to Tarshish, and now, in Paul's case, the ship owner's money, which sets aside Paul's counsel. But the power of the money disappears in both storms. There's only a single power to deal with now, God and God's salvation. In the storm, God is experienced as total and prayer the only action adequate to the reality. The oblivion of sleep in Jonah can't avoid that reality. The frenzy of ropes and oars in Paul's case can't affect that reality. The power of money is reduced to a minus quality. Only prayer is left. This human response and participation in what God has set out to do and is doing. And what he's doing is accomplishing salvation. And what Jonah and Paul are both doing or not doing is being vocationally part of it. The only thing that the sailors found useful to do in the storm in both cases was to lighten the ship, get rid of what was heretofore assumed to be their primary concern. On Jonah's ship, they threw the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it. <clears throat> On Paul's ship, they began next day to throw the cargo overboard. The third day, cast out with their own hands the tackle of the ship. <clears throat> Fourteen days later, it was more desperate, and they threw all the wheat into the sea. As God's action intensifies, the significance of our human lives, <clears throat> and even especially since we are here most apt to depart from it, the significance of our vocational lives comes into a single, <clears throat> a single focus of who we are, not what we have to offer him, not what we can do to help him. And in this way, the vocations of Jonah and Paul are purified, purified of both good intentions, which is Paul's case, purified of bad intentions, which is Jonah's case, purified. Vocations. Such as these must, if they're to be worth anything at all, and I'm talking now about your vocation and my vocation, have to be witnesses to God, responses to God. Everything else needs to throw overboard, get rid of it. A vocation must not be permitted to get in the way of God's work, take over the work of God, either negatively or positively. The result of this reduction of God's ministries to the baseline simplicities of either non-prayer or prayer was the salvation of all. All Jonah's sailors were saved. All Paul's sailors were saved. There's a suggestion in both accounts of something world-inclusive. In the Jonah story, according to Jewish tradition, this is extra-biblical, there are representatives of all 70 nations on board Jonah's ship. And there were about 76. One textual variant has 276 on Paul's ship. The assembly of the saved <clears throat> bars exceptions and is quite beyond either the intentions of Jonah or the capacities of Paul. You see, the storm is the essential context in these stories, the condition in which the story takes place, this realization that nothing else counts but we're immersed in something which isn't going right and which God is not pleased with not going right. And in that 
totalizing of the context. Prayer is the essential action. In the Jonah story, the sailors pray, each praying to his own God, then to Yahweh. And the captain asks Jonah to pray to his God, but Jonah doesn't do it. Jonah will later pray from the fish's belly, but the salvation by then has already been accomplished. Paul, on the other hand, was the only one on his ship to pray. The crew was prayerless, having abandoned all hope. But Paul prayed, prayed through the darkest of their nights and received the gospel message, Paul, do not be afraid. In the morning, he passed the gospel on to the ship's crew, take heart. I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. Later, he gathered everyone on that doomed ship to worship God in the breaking of bread and prayers. If that wasn't the Eucharist, it was something very much like the Eucharist. Trouble, especially extreme trouble, storm trouble, strips us of our essentials, strips us to the essentials, and reveals the basic realities of our lives. In Jonah, it was prayerlessness. In Paul, it was prayerfulness. The storm revealed Jonah to be a prophet who did not pray, and in Paul, a prophet who, an apostle who did pray. These two large sea storm stories bracket two stories of Jesus in the Gospels, also sea storm stories. In the first, Jesus, like Jonah, was asleep in the middle of the storm. He has to be awakened. Unlike Jonah, he stills the storm with his word. In the second story, Jesus, coming from a place of prayer, calms the frightened friends with his fear not, the same word that Paul used on his ship, fear not. So Jesus, now training his disciples to live vocationally, uses the sea storms in which they're out of control to embrace a life of prayer in which they participate in God's control. The two Jesus stories reverberate back to Jonah and forward to Paul. We listen to these stories and we let this storm metaphor and this prayer action shape our vocations. Such powerful pictures, powerful stories, gathering us back, centering us down. We gradually loosen our grips on our job descriptions and ease ourselves into this God-called work. The connecting thread in these stories is prayer, this articulation of human response to the Word of God, this Word that creates and saves. The sea storms call into question our vocations, but they at the same time become the means to our recovery of vocation. They show up the failure, which now becomes recovery. They expose us to what we cannot manage and shouldn't pretend to manage. We return to a kind of primordial chaos, the tohu vabohu of Genesis 1, but then also to this wind spirit God who hovers over this chaos and brings something clean and light, formed, saved out of it. Our vocations are God-called, God-shaped life work. And the moment we quit dealing primarily with God, no longer living in conscious, willing, participatory relation with this vast reality which constitutes not only the world, but now our vocation, the storm exposes the futility of our work, or it confirms the authenticity of our work. Either way, the storm is diagnostic. And we become aware that God constitutes our work. We cannot, and I, I don't know why I have to say this, except I know I do. I have to say it to myself over and over and over again. We're disabused by these stories of any suggestion that we can avoid or manipulate God in our work. 
And once we begin to realize that, we're ready, we're motivated, we're desperate to acquire a spirituality that's adequate to our vocation, working truly, easily, fearlessly, without ambition or anxiety, without denial or sloth. Amen.